So, uh, good evening. I'm Stefan Ruchti with the Swiss Foreign Ministry, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this side event, which is organized jointly by ACT Alliance and Switzerland, and with the support of ETH Zurich. Our side event seeks to set the concept of equity in relation to the Paris Agreement, with a specific focus on the global stock take. Recent years have seen numerous attempts to operationalize equity and to propose a fair burden sharing across all countries. But the global stock take that will evaluate global climate efforts in 2023 requires assessing equity at the global level, which is conceptually not an easy feat. It is my great pleasure to welcome a set of distinguished speakers and panelists who will help us to address the topic at hand. All the speakers and panelists would each merit a thorough introduction, so I hope you'll forgive me if, in the interest of time, I'll be very brief. We are delighted to have Rudelmar Bueno de Faria with us. Rudelmar Bueno de Faria is the General Secretary of ACT Alliance, and he will introduce the issue. Franz Bere, Switzerland's Ambassador for the Environment, will equally share a few introductory words. Heading the Swiss negotiation team at COP23, Franz Bere will unfortunately have to leave us early and join another meeting. But thanks anyway for coming. Eh? Thanks a lot. Among the panelists who will delve more deeply into the topic, I'd like to welcome Alison Doig, the head of policy at ACT Alliance. Alison Doig will look at the topic from a civil society perspective and include a link to next year's facilitative dialogue, which will provide a first assessment where the international community stands with their climate efforts. Xolisa Ngwadla, who we're still uh, waiting for. He is with the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research in South Africa. He is one of the key negotiators on equity issues, including with relation to the global goal for adaptation. Xolisa Ngwadla will look at the equity issue in more general terms and related to the Paris Agreement. Further, we are very pleased to have Ottmar Edenhofer with us. Ottmar Edenhofer is Chief Economist at PIC Potsdam, and he has extensively worked within the IPCC, including as co-chair of one of its three working groups. Today, Ottmar Edenhofer will look at the interlinkage of carbon pricing, equity, and the Paris Climate Goals. Last but not least, we have uh, Lukas Bretschker of ETH Zurich with us. Lukas Bretschker currently serves as president of the European Association of Environmental and Resource Economists, and today he will tie equity principles to the challenge of a truly globalized stock take. I know I did not justice to any of our speakers and panelists, but dare to ask Franz Bere and Rudelmar Bruno de Faria to share their introductory remarks. Franz Bere. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and let me indicate it's a big pleasure to be here. And I would also like to welcome to, to have that opportunity to briefly address that important issue here. And I would also like, of course, to thank ACT Alliance for working together with, with Switzerland to, to organize these side events, the distinguished panelists. I'm really sad that I will not be able to listen to you, but I hope that I will be able to get your PowerPoint presentations because it is really a very exciting topic. And I would also like to thank you, Stefan, for all the efforts you put into, into making that, that side event possible. As you may know, negotiators, they like clear concepts that lend themselves easily to discussions, concepts that lead us straight forward to implementation. And I think you have to agree that neither CBDR, CBDRRC or whatever is such an easy conflict and equity definitely is not such a simple concept that lends itself, uh, itself directly to implementation. However, it is an important uh, uh, concept that must lead our, our negotiations, because if you are uh, um, negotiating an outcome that is not felt as equitable, this outcome probably will also not be fully implemented by each, uh, by each concerned. It is clear that the global stock take in 2023 shall assess equity at the global level. At the same time, equity concepts are also highly important to determine national efforts. 
In Switzerland, in Switzerland, when developing its NDCs, we were using equity consideration and also explaining them when, when handing in our NDC. Switzerland was also using equity consideration when determining its share to the fast start uh, financing and also when we try to determine what should be a fair share of Switzerland which it should contribute to the 100 billion which developed countries should uh, mobilize for developing countries each year by 2020. Of course, there are many different ways of uh, defining or understanding what equity means. There are different concepts, and these different concepts might also lead to different results. But it is important to start with some concepts, and then also to discuss these concepts, to exchange views, and to learn from each other. There are many ways to see something as equitable. There's probably not one truth, one only single truth way, but it's important to start to share its equity consideration, to exchange with each other, so, so that we can also well, criticize it, not in a negative manner, but in a motivating manner uh, to explain why perhaps we think equity could be looked at differently. When it comes to mitigation, a way to measuring global equity may be found in setting current global emissions in relation to the necessary emission reduction paths in, uh, in, uh, in, in with a look at the intergener intergenerational equity. I think that is a very important element also, not only lo look at equity between us today, but also the equity between today and the future generations. When it comes to adaptation, things might get even more complicated. And I think if you'd ask me, well, what would be the solution to look at equity guiding us for adaptation, mitigation, I think there's no clear answer. And that is the reason why it is so important to have events like this one here, where different equity concepts are presented and are discussed and can stimulate each other. I'm really sad that I'm uh, and sorry that I have to leave. But I'm, I'm looking forward uh, to hear about the side event. Uh, I'm really looking forward also to look at, at the slides. And I'm looking most importantly forward to have this side event impacting the negotiations in the other zone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Franz Beller. Thank you very much. Pleased to warmly welcome you to this side event that act honor to co-host with the Swiss government. ACT Alliance is the world's largest Protestant and Orthodox humanitarian development and advocacy network. With a membership of uh, 146 organizations uh, and a presence in over 125 uh, countries. Our humanitarian work is continuously affected by extreme weather conditions. At the moment, we have active humanitarian operations in the Caribbean, Eastern and Horn Africa, Southeast Asia, and other parts of the world that are affected by tropical storms, droughts, and flooding. The poor and most vulnerable are hit at the hardest. And in many cases, the same communities face significant challenges of inequality, economic injustices, and unmet basic needs. Because climate change has had and continues to have a significant impact on the communities we serve and on the work we do, we see it from a human rights, sustainable development, and justice perspective. The Paris Agreements, the Sustainable Development Goals, the Sendai framework for disaster risk reductions are important global frameworks that set the long-term agenda for action towards climate, resilient, and sustainable communities. The implementation of these frameworks should be ambitious and adhere to the key principles of gender justice, human rights, and equity. It must not be further enhanced in justice or disproportionately burdening the poor and the most vulnerable. The Paris Agreements and the SDGs invite the participation of all countries and stakeholders. Such participation will contribute to a sustainable and climate-safe future for all. ACT Alliance, together with our ecumenical partners, will continue to mobilize the resources, partnerships, and constituency to ensure that we were also contributing to solutions. We should continue to highlight global resilience, sustainability, 
and solidarity with climate vulnerable people. To this end, I'm very grat grateful to the government of Switzerland for the collaboration on this specific event, side event, as well as several dialogues on climate equity in the past. We trust that these conversations are helpful in further enhancing our understanding as the various aspects of the Paris agreements continue to be elaborated. Thank you very much and welcome again to this side event. Thank you very much, General Secretary. May I please ask you, Alison Doig, to look at the topic from a civil society perspective. Um, good evening. Um, so, yes, I'm, I'm head of policy, but not for Act Alliance, for, for Christian Aid, which is the uh, UK member of the Act Alliance. Um, Christian Aid has been following these climate negotiations for 10 years now, and since the beginning of that time, we have taken climate justice, and particularly the equity issue, as our, one of our central themes. We have worked all that time to bring these issues in through Copenhagen, through Paris, and, and now into the facilitative dialogues and, and beyond. Um, I wanted to, to thank Riddle Mar for, for grounding this discussion in the context of the disasters that are happening, of the need for sustainable development, of the real life that this negotiation goes on in. I think that's really important. And in doing that, um, moved on. I just wanted to remind people um, the level of urgency that we're facing. And the, the reason why, people talk about two degrees, but the reason why 1.5 degrees is so important, keeping below that level. And if you were sat in this room for the previous um, presentations, which were about climate migration, and we had an impassioned uh, presentation um, from Tuvalu, where they are desperately trying not to admit that they're going to have to evacuate. <laughs> they're desperately saying we're staying, but knowing that they have a future that's uncertain. You will realise why 1.5 is so important to stay within. And I think one of the reasons why 1.5, the scientists give, is because we can come back from that. It's somewhere we can go up to. It will be an impact. We, have, we are already seeing it. But there's a way to recover, there's a way to bring it back into safer territory. As we move to two degrees, the natural forces come into play. The, the feedback loops, the methane from the, from the Arctic, the, the trees start to, to the deforestation ha starts to happen at a rapid race. We don't know if we can come back from that. If we go up to three degrees, and the NDCs, if you add them all up together, go to 3.7 degrees, if we go that far, we actually don't know what's going to happen. We can predict some of the physical outcomes just, but we don't know what that impact that will have on lives, on livelihoods, on economy. So do we dare take that risk? So I would say that um, how do we, I mean, the question really then is how does this negotiation deliver that 1.5? How do we get ourselves on the track, back on track? We're so far off. And I think the first thing is admitting the scale of the task. We're on track to 3.7. We need to double, quadruple, move up our effort between now and 2030, not 2050. We need to move now. I think this means unprecedented cooperation between countries. We need to work together. And what that working together needs is trust. We need trust that if I'm going to take my move, you'll take it with me that you'll do your fair share, that you'll take on, you're the rich country, you take on your share, you help us do our fair share, that we actually recognise and are open to that discussion. And actually, some say that the, the, the like-minded countries and some of the developing countries are, you know, get really angry about this issue, but it's because they see lack of, there's no trust. What trust do you have if we don't have Kyoto 2 ratified? What trust do we have if the climate finance isn't coming forward? We need to admit the, the, what we have to do, and we have to take on our fair shares. And finally, I would say that we have to then deliver through real-world situations. We actually, we, need, we can't be continually, oh, we'll just put some money in coal over there, or we'll put, or put it into developing diesel cars over there, if what we need to do is move to an absolute new type of economy. Now, why I said it was civil society perspectives, and I can talk with confidence that what I'm giving as a civil society perspective is, is that the equity that Christian Aid and our partners and our friends have been talking about all these years has now been adopted by, and the, the report that we're releasing today, you've got a little postcard, and you can instantly download it onto your iPhone or iPad with your QR code. Um, 
th th this report has been supported by over 120 CSOs um, from around the world. That's faith groups, it's NGOs, the environmental NGOs, the development NGOs, it's, it's justice movements, it's trade unions, it's a whole range of organisations from every, every continent have signed on to this um, calling for equity to unlock... Um, the ambition that is needed. So we need a fair outcome. And we're not saying, it, what we're saying is that all countries have to take that move, but they have to do it in different ways. And really the next slide um, is the scary slide, particularly if you're from the USA or Europe. And try, just very, very briefly, this is our analysis. As we say, there's many definitions of, of equity, but actually um, this analysis shows a range. The green bar is the fair shares. If you were to cut your carbon by as much as the green bar and for the USA, for Europe, for China, you're doing your fair share. And that bar shows some of that variation. Do we take responsibility, back, historic responsibility, back to 1990 or 1850? How much do we classify um, capacity in terms of our economic ability to move? How do you define the right to development? So we've taken that into consideration, which is why we have this range of what we consider fair shares. The red bar is definitely not fair. The little bars, the black bars you see across, are the NDC commitments. So the US NDC commitment is currently less than a quarter, probably less, about a fifth of what it should be doing. Same for the European Union. You can see that, that India and China are actually prepared to do about their fair share. The other stark thing in that graph is that the, the dotted line is, if, if, if USA was to reach that dotted line, it would have zero domestic carbon emissions. And you think, well, how can it do more than that? But you look at, well, I wouldn't so, so much say China, but certainly India. You look at many of the developing countries, they have capacity to do further. They have more mitigation capacity. So the US, Europe has to be prepared to help, to fund, to support, give technology to the poorer countries to meet, help them go realise their potential for change, their potential to go low carbon, or their potential to leapfrog to a low carbon future. So, one last slide really, and I suppose that's relating it back to these negotiations, if we were to have a fair outcome, I think what we need is a new global era of cooperation that has equity, fairness, trust at its heart. We need to realise the urgency, upper urgency of 1.5, so I would say the facilitative dialogue really needs to open that conversation about upping the NDCs across the board. Um, it means means of implementation, that's finance, technology being transferred, genuinely, cooperatively being transferred and given and coming forward. We can't forget, as we heard there from, from the Minister, um, from the representative from Switzerland, the, the adaptation loss and damage. You can't be saying, I'll do this, and, you know, that, that, that really those two cannot be lost in equity. They have to be done in a fair and equitable way as well. It has to be gender fair. You have to leave no one. In your solutions, there are many solutions to this problem, but they have to really be fair for all people and take, for example, gender issues in place. There must be. We know the pathway we need to take. We need a just transition. We need to look at the job changes, the decent work that's coming out of that, and plan for those changes for communities that will be affected. And we have to redirect public finance investment away from the bad and into the good, which gives me a little plug, if you'll allow me one minute, um, for, for Christian Aid, um, Christian Aid's campaign that's been adopted internationally, our Big Shift campaign. Our Big Shift campaign is exactly about that. How do we shift investment out of fossil fuels? And how do we get it into renewable energy? And particularly for the justice perspective, how do we get it to those 1.2 billion people around the world with no electricity or cooking on a dirty stove? So it's about those real life, I come back to that, real life actions that have to complement. You can't hide the fact you're, you're investing in coal and fossil fuels. You have to, behind, oh, I'm doing a solar power, look, I'm here, and while you're handing money over here to the, to the wrong. So I, I think that's really important. So I'll, I'll stop there. Um, and just to remind you, do look up the report. All the detail, the technical details of the analysis can be sourced through the, the report as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for this presentation. I regret that our expert, Xolisa Nguadla, who was going to speak in particular on adaptation, which is a very hard uh, aspect to, to tackle, is not with us. I guess we'll have to organize another side event uh, 
as soon as possible addressing uh, the topic of equity and adaptation. But uh, we still have two excellent speakers with us. And uh, if you find uh, a way to address adaptation by any means, that would be great. But anyway, so Otmar Edenhofer will now look at the interlinkage of carbon pricing, equity, and the Paris Climate Goals. The floor is yours, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, thanks for the invitation to talk about this important topic on equity. When I will talk on equity and justice in my presentation, I will make a quite modest proposal uh, from a purely philosophical and normative point of view. You could be much more ambitious but I want to propose a moderate proposal in order to make uh, this proposal accessible and implementable. So let me remind us, and you know all this graph, but it seems to me it is worthwhile uh, to recall that in the 2000s, we had an era of a very strong increase of carbon emissions, an annual growth at roughly around uh, 2% per annum. So in the last few years, probably we have stabilized uh, the emissions, but uh, let's see uh, if we are really on track on stabilizing the emissions and then to decline the emissions. The reason why I'm a little bit skeptical about this is that if you look at the, the, the profile of emission reduction in the different countries, you see, for example, that in China, there's a lot of things going on, in particular, a strong political will to reduce uh, local air pollution and also uh, to reduce uh, emissions. In the United States, we have seen so far a strong substitution of coal by gas, but uh, still India is catching up. And if you look at the uh, energy sources like coal, oil and gas, you can see that over the last decade we have seen a large scale renaissance of coal. And therefore the rumors and the reports of the terminal a decline of coal seems to me exaggerated and premature. Because in the next few years, we have to deal, from my point of view, with the coal issue. And coal and the coal issue is one of the most important entry points for an effective climate policy. And only when we can address coal, we can keep the door open for more ambitious climate goals. So what's the, from an economic point of view, the most important problem? The most important problem is that in Paris we have decided that we want to release only a limited amount of CO2 into the atmosphere. And here I have taken a number, roughly 800 gigatons CO2. 800 gigatons is by no means consistent with a 1.5 degree target. Even for a 2 degree target, it's not safe. But I have chosen this moderate number and to compare it with the enormous amount of reserves and resource which we have underground in, of coal, oil and gas. So when carbon capture and storage will be available, and this means basically we have another storage underground, 70% of coal, one third of oil and gas has to remain underground. If carbon capture and storage is not available due to uh, social acceptil acceptability reasons or technical reasons, 90% of coal and two-thirds of oil and gas has to remain underground. And this is an enormous challenge ahead of us. So the, basically, if you then calculate what's needed for an effective uh, climate treaty, this basically means roughly to achieve a two-degree target means a reduction, an annual reduction of emissions roughly around 4% per annum, and if we want to achieve a 1.5 degree target, it's roughly almost 77 to 10% per annum. This is unprecedented in economic history since industrialization. So you know all these numbers, but I would like to remind us the enormous challenge ahead of us. So I told you that basically the Paris Agreement is roughly around 800 gigaton, but this is not the goal well below two degree. Uh, so for a well below two degree, it's probably 600 gigatons for a 1.5, it's much lower. But the most important aspect is that the NDCs, the National Determined Contributions, roughly adds up to 600 gigatons CO2 by 2030. After that, we need a dramatic reduction of emissions. <laughs> 
when you basically calculate the existing and the planned coal-fired plants around the globe over their economic lifetime, so this adds up roughly to 380 gigatons CO2. So almost half of the uh, 800 gigatons is absorbed by coal-fired plants. And you might argue so that China and India has revised their expansion of coal, and you are right, they have reduced their current uh, plans significantly. But if you look at other countries like Turkey, Indonesia, Japan, Bangladesh, Philippines, you see there are very ambitious uh, expansion of coal-fired plants. And I have shown you this slide not to blame other countries. So this is just the number of countries who are responsible for 80% of the new coal-fired capacities. But as a German, I am absolutely entitled to blame my own government. Even in Germany, we have a huge problem with coal. Since 2002, we have built 16 new coal-fired plants. And under the current debate of the, where basically a new government is forming, we have huge problems to come up with a reasonable proposal to phase out coal significantly. Now, we have shifted domestically almost the debate from phase out of coal to electric mobility, which is an insane discussion because electric cars requires a fully decarbonized power sector when electric mobility should lead to a decline of emissions. So this is not to blame other countries. I could blame my own country and the problems we have in particular in Germany and in Europe for the phase out of coal. But now let me come to the fairness and the equity issue. Basically what we have here is in the Paris Agreement is basically a kind of a bottom, a combination of a top-down and a bottom-up approach where we basically have pledges, voluntary agreements, we basically have the UNEP gap report showing what's the emission gap and also the UNEP gap report has emphasized the enormous importance of the coal issue and the requirement for the phase out and then we have a kind of an iteration process and the crucial question which I would like to address in the last few minutes is how to address this and what kind of scheme is conceivable to come up with a, an iteration process which in the end leads to a ratchet up of the ambitions. So my argument is basically the following. The current national determined contributions are not transparent. This is also not new. It's known almost, it's agreed and known by everybody. Countries determine targets with different means and different reference years. The nationally determined contributions are therefore not comparable. Emission reduction targets are based uh, on the same year, means very different efforts, depending on the development stage of a country. And the nationally determined contributions are not represented in most of the energy policies. So therefore, it seems to me it is worthwhile to think about a common metric which might be useful uh, for uh, compare the efforts among countries. And here I would like to start with an observation. And the observation is that we basically see around the globe a landscape of emerging carbon pricing systems, weak carbon pricing systems. But just when China will basically implement their emission trading scheme in 2017, it's open to debate if it is implemented this year or next year or it will be postponed another year. But nevertheless, when China will implement their emissions trading scheme, already 20% of all the emissions are then under a carbon pricing regulation scheme. So therefore, my proposal is we should start uh, with, a car with this uh, a carbon pricing schemes. Why? Because carbon pricing and, uh, is, are transparent. So it can be implemented either as a carbon tax or a cap and trade system and even in standards would create an implicit carbon price. A carbon price, a price on carbon is comparable. It has the same metric for all the countries and it measures to counteract free riding as a principle of, res of reciprocity and can be implemented relatively easy. And a carbon price drives energy investment, drives innovation and makes more emission intensive ways of production more costly and less attractive. So this is just a number of carbon pricing schemes. So this is basically a calculation which has been done by Potsdam Institute and the Remind uh, Group, which is represented here by Elmar Kriegler, 
And what you can see here is that basically uh, by 2013, 50, there are quite heterogeneous uh, spread of carbon prices. So if we want to be consistent with the two degree target, we can live for the next decade with quite different and uh, 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 non-harmonized carbon prices. But after 2030, given the enormous uh, uh, ambition we have, we need a quite drastic increase of the carbon prices. If you show such a slide to the finance ministers, normally they are quite shocked. So in the experience in Germany is a quite telling one. So you can tell to the politicians and say, oh, we want to reduce emissions by 2050, that's roughly at 80%, they say it gets okay. But if you say this would require a carbon price in the power sector of roughly 30 to 50 euros per ton CO2, then they are totally shocked. But after they recover from the shock, you could tell them another story. You could say, yes, it is true that basically the assets for coal, oil, and gas owners are, be, will be reduced. But at the same time, carbon prices, and you can this is on the slide, creates a kind of revenues, carbon revenues, you could, uh, could uh, call this a, a climate rent. And this climate rent and this carbon pricing revenues overcompensates in most of the countries the reduction of the uh, values of the fossil fuel assets. And this is, from my point of view, a quite telling story because this revenue from carbon pricing can be reduced either to reduce distortionary taxes, to reduce public debt, or to invest and use this carbon revenues for sustainable development goals. We have calculated that just a phase out of carbon subsidies would uh, allow uh, 20, uh, 70 countries around the globe just uh, to invest a universal access to clean water. So the crucial thing is then, what has this to do with equity issues? And now I try to skip or to proceed my slides. It's not possible. So when I want, ah, yeah, when I want to come to, to equity, so it it's becomes complicated. So the most important thing what I would like to argue is carbon pricing will not be successful if it is not complemented by a reasonable transfer scheme. And we thought very hard in our institutes, so what kind of transfer system could enhance international cooperation? So how should we use the one billion promised uh, money uh, in, the, in the Green Climate Fund and how to increase this to make this uh, 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 operational? So we come up with the following proposal. The best way uh, to incentivize the increase of carbon pricing in countries would be basically an equal effort principle. How can we implement this equal effort principle? So we could compare basically the mitigation costs which are required on an average basis around the globe. And if countries are above uh, the, miti the average mitigation costs, they should be compensated by the Green Climate Fund or by another fund which provides this conditional transfers to countries who cannot afford a reasonable high carbon price. Countries who have mitigation costs below the average, so they will be then the donor countries. And again, uh, what my colleagues from the Potsdam Institute have done in a quite interesting uh, modeling comparison exercise, basically to calculate this uh, equal effort sharing, it shows uh, that basically a quite ambitious uh, scenario uh, could be affordable when the payments and the transfers in particular come from Europe and the North America, and basically to channel transfers in order to allow countries to increase the carbon price. So in that sense, I would argue in the following way. First, the ambition ahead of us requires a quite dedicated policies. This dedicated policies cannot be implemented without international cooperation and coordination. Carbon prices are a metric to measure the efforts different countries can and will undertake. Over the next few years, we need increasing ambition. And this increasing ambition means increasing implicit or explicit carbon pricing schemes. Some countries, many countries, will not afford such carbon prices in, in, in order to make uh, sure that we have an equal effort sharing. This requires a transfer scheme, which basically means countries who have higher mitigation costs should be subsidized and should uh, be 
recipient countries from a conditional transfer scheme. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Otmar Riedenhofer, and I'm delighted that uh, Xolis and Guadla also made it here. It's sometimes very hard to get away from the negotiations, so we very much appreciate that you're with us. And we'll move on right now to Lukas Bretschke first, and then Xolisa will have the last presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this panel. I'm very honored to be here. I have entitled my presentation Productive Use of Equity Principles on a Global Level. And I can actually nicely put up and, 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 uh, and can get up with the uh, ideas and, and uh, many thoughtful uh, considerations of my former speakers. We had results on the urgency of the issue. We had uh, well the, the resources that we have uh, to leave in the ground. Then in the end, Otmar Edenhofer talked about the mechanisms guiding us toward a, a probable system of global equity. And I th actually there, I wanted to extend, I wanted to elaborate a bit and uh, maybe stress some different effects. I will talk about prices, but as an economist, I sometimes realize that uh, this is not always well received. So I will rather talk on quantities, on carbon budgets, but of course, this also has a price implication. It's mostly a matter of uh, communication, but I think in the end, it is also that prices can have a huge equity uh, impact. And he, of course, observed this, what many people uh, don't see when, when they set high prices, that this might be a huge equity uh, uh, challenge. I I start with uh, I put the wrong part. I start with the UNEP language uh, with the gaps. We all know that we have an emission gap, which is of course also an ambition gap because uh, policies are not sufficient. On the one hand, we have really uh, well temperature targets we we believe in we should achieve. On the other hand, as we all know, these nationally determined uh, contributions and. Also there, as an economist, I always have to defend in my profession that this makes a lot of sense, this bottom-up approach, because the first challenge was to have a broad participation. Basically, everybody is on board now. So uh, it's, it's even that now Syria wants to uh, be in the Paris Agreement. So we have basically all the countries uh, in, in on board. But as we have heard it before from the two former speakers, we still are not on track. We have to increase our ambition. And equity should be now one of the main mechanisms to, to bring us uh, additional uh, inputs to gain momentum in this whole process. We have also an assessment gap in a sense that we, on the one hand, on the, based on the uh, Paris Agreement, should see our progress on a global uh, level. We have an aggregate, well, well we, we, we check uh, our emissions on the aggregate level. On the other hand, we are required to observe in light of equity criterion, we, we know in the convention that we have CBDR, the Common Border Differentiated Responsibilities Requirement, and also the RC, the respective capabilities, and also the national circumstances which has, have come in in the Paris Agreement. All these things go together. So the, the bottom uh, line is about the, the uh, country-specific contributions, but on the other hand, we have a global assessment, and then we have to find out uh, that these two things do not yet well go together, and we have to find mechanisms to, to bring them into more coherence, more consistent. Is equity uh, important? Of course, it's important in the Paris Agreement. We have it at uh, several important paragraphs, uh, purpose, mitigation, and then especially for the global stock take, and this is where uh, my uh, contribution then will end today, how can we structure the discussion about the global stock take on, on this equity uh, discussion in, in a very productive way? Knowing that we have now uh, moved, when we look at the policy assessment, in the first way from the country level to the global level. So there is an asymmetry, or you say there's a puzzle or is a conundrum. We say, on the one hand, we want to have a global assessment. We have only one globe, globe equal one. And equity necessarily implies more than one part, so there's several parts. So we have to, of course, uh, compare what different parties are doing. But not in the way it has been happening in the past. We have to uh, find a new process, which is a more productive process, uh, so uh, that we can have, uh, in the end, uh, uh, increase in ambition, uh, all a joint effort. So the open issue is when we start from here, from this puzzle, is can we derive in a, in a future process a notion of global equity?
When we compare the mitigation, adaptation efforts of the single parties, when we look at the provision of the means of implementation of capacity building, can we bring this together in a way that in the end we will have a sense of a global equity? How we could do this in a sense that it is kind of a new, uh, has a new uh, flavor compared to the burden sharing, which is always, you know, the burden is something heavy and people, uh, they think they have to suffer tremendously. But on the other hand, it's a, it's a chance sharing. We should, should see about it. We talked about the rents, but also in, in, in technologies, we have lots of, of opportunities. So can we reframe the discussion in a more productive way? And then uh, finally, also importantly, can we assess what, what the different countries have promised, what they want to do, and what they are actually ha are doing. So can we use our metric, our, our common understanding, uh, in, in, uh, when we apply it to what actually has been promised, what's actually done in current policies? This is basically our solution approach. Not focus on a, rather, on a final global equity, but rather on a process. Because it's, we don't have yet a common understanding we have to establish first in, uh, in a productive dialogue. We should have a broad exchange on equity issues, which has not happened until now. So we had a very distinct discussion in the parties, and some parties have had, had some considerations, but many don't really have something there. And we should do this as we have it now in, in a productive inclusive uh, dialogue, not, not uh, finger pointing, not, not pointing single countries out, but develop together something which can be uh, brought uh, further. And uh, the bottom line is also something which is, of course, uh, well, it, it's really an, an intention, an aim of, of us as, as scientists, that we should also, like in the temperature target discussion, include science and use the input of science in this equity dialogue. So this Dialogue would have different parts. We could have on the first, uh, well, for, for the next year, uh, as we call it, inclusive, participatory and transport dialogue, uh, according to Talanoa, in, in a productive way. But this should be, in, according to our view, complemented by uh, what we call in light of equity in the best available science. So then science would have a different, uh, distinct impact on this uh, dialogue. So on the one hand, of course, all the positive elements that we have now in the negotiations, plus something which adds from the scientific point of view on this equity dialogue. I would imagine that one could envisage something like a structured equity di expert dialogue. We had the structured expert equity uh, expert dialogue uh, in previous years about IPCC and, and the parties, and now one could maybe broaden it. Uh, all the par all the NGOs and all the scientists who have to uh, have contributed to this equity uh, di con uh, discussion could bring in this uh, at at the joint meetings with the parties at the COP. So we could uh, ensure that we have a scientific integrity of the dialogue, that parties uh, uh, learn what, what, what are the main I issues there, and that we have a structure in the dialogue so that is uh, uh, not productive, not leading us uh, to, to dead end. Something that we propose here is the CAP, the Climate Ambition Assessment Platform. This is something from our, which we will start now. But of course, we are well aware that there are other initiatives and this is good, so so we should have several uh, who think about the common metric, who bring in their views on how, how these equity issues should be framed. And from the discussion among the peers, among the uh, uh, scientists, with the parties, we will learn something for the future. I will now quickly refer to what I see as a scientific uh, uh, background for the whole discussion, but then, then I will in the end, of course, focus on equity, because I think this is the most important in this context quickly about climate economics, because this will come back when we see the uh, cost and benefit of the 2 and then 1.5 degrees Celsius target next year. I believe that the recent economic research has made substantial progress, because before we had a really distinct discussion uh, at, at the COP and then from, from climate physicists, we had the temperature targets, while the economists were always talking about optimal warming. Now we have learned and we of course have taken into account that the previous discussion we have well, we had a, a debate about discounting. S many models have not included risk and uncertainty in a proper way. Damage functions have been uh, without a good foundation. Many things have not been included. One can say, uh, to, to keep it uh, short, that by uh, the, uh, developing the economic uh, modeling about the climate change, we have a convergence so that now also the temperature targets are well in line with what, what the recent uh, research uh, 
has provided. And finally, also economists have learned uh, to talk about these equity issues which have been before uh, basically, uh, well, so something which has not been considered within the economy, within with uh, economists. Policy instruments, we do have prices, and I think the price is a very powerful and forceful instrument, of course. We talk about uniform carbon prices, but at the same time, we always have to think about what are the equity implications. I will show this in a slide a bit later. We can also talk about quantities, which is easier for communication. We can talk about the carbon budget, because we know for every temperature target, we have a carbon budget, which is, which is uh, consistent. And then it is about the burden share, while well, it's about the cake eating, uh, uh, how much you, you uh, well, allocate, how you allocate the different uh, pieces of the cake. We can also use different uh, policy mechanisms. You know the norms, for example, for the cars have had a huge impact. Uh, economists normally would uh, favor the prices, but we can also, by implementing strong norms, we can have a, a quite a, a huge impact on, on actually current development. And we can do this uh, evaluation in terms of efficiency and also the equity. And we, we think that is a strength if we uh, leave the countries the, the decision uh, how they want to uh, implement this policy in, in for their national circumstances. Can we think about enhancing the ambitions by forming country coalitions uh, very briefly? I mean, we had the High Ambition Coalition, which has a tremendous impact in Paris. We had the idea of climate clubs, which came from the United States, from North House in, in Yale, and we had the idea always that the G7, G20, G whatever should also take the lead. I mean, these things have basically vanished in the last uh, year, so uh, we have to give up on these ideas, and I think we could form different coalitions. But you know, the problem of the coalition is if, if you have a few countries together, and if one of the players is not playing anymore, then of course this is very vulnerable construct. So we could, of course, uh, bring with a, a lower subsample of countries, we could have stricter rules, or we could have uh, closer commitments, but of course this is very... Uh, uh, yeah, uh, this is of course very sensible if one big player is not uh, playing. Now I'm coming to the final part, which is about how to now implement equity principles for, for guiding the process. The basic advantage of these equity principles is that we have them already implemented national policies. We already know how they work. We have a tax, uh, normally we have tax laws, we have uh, burden sharing between regions and countries. So these are things which are known to, to people doing policy. They're part of uh, expectations. We can verify them and now we can apply them to the climate no negotiating process and reduce the complexity of the whole process. These are the principles that we propose, and of course I'm, I'm aware that there are more of them, and this should also be part of the discussion, where should we put the focus uh, on? Ability to pay or the capacity of a country is something which everybody would agree. In the end it's a question how much we should weight this uh, factor, but in fact it's always there. Policy cost sharing, sometimes not appearing with different uh, proposals. I believe in all the environmental policy uh, proposals that we have seen in the, in the past or we've implemented, it was always, it's not grandfathering, but it's kind of the, those who have adjusted the most, they have to be helped the most. And those who don't have to adjust, it's a bit about the, uh, what we heard of before about the mitigation costs, so we, we should take this into consideration. Merit principle, something which is very uh, common in, in the in ethical discussion about wage distribution, income distribution, one should give those uh, a, a merit who, uh, who will contribute for solving uh, problems. And then uh, going back to Aristotle, one should compare like with like. This has much to do with economic development. One should also look at available technologies. We have now the possibility to uh, apply uh, new green uh, technologies and of course now to, to implement a new coal power plant has a different meaning than it was in the last century. So we, based on these things, we can develop a metric which is still flexible but which gives kind of a guidance and we can compare this metric with something that has also been proposed and now come back to the equity issue with the global carbon tax, the global carbon price and the egalitarian allocation of the carbon budget. So here on this slide you see a um, comparison of, of uh, three principles the one, the green one, the straight one would be when you implement common taxes and have the tax revenues fully spent within a country. The egalitarian, the red one would be if you, if you implement a, an equal distribution of, of global common budget. And you see that the blue one, the one that we're proposing, the equity base, is kind of a pro compromise in the middle. And it has very good reason that we, can, uh, not imp we should not implement one or the other extreme, but we should stay in the middle. So the common budget will be uh, distributed according to a compromise. 
For the platform that we are proposing, we think we should in include all the countries, we should provide basic data, and we should propose such a common metric, but we should still be flexible in the sense that we want to talk about which, uh, which of these uh, uh, equity principles should be included and how much should be the weights. And we would also then find out what is the uh, flexibility, what is the robustness of our uh, results with respect when we change a bit uh, the, uh, the different, uh, well, the bit different weights. Historic responsibility, when do we start? and how much do we weight economic development. So this would be to provide the basic information about uh, uh, policy achievements, what could the exchanges between countries, and what could especially also exchange uh, the best policy practices. I'm almost there. I wanted to give a hint at, at the, the foundation. We have a, developed a climate calculator, as I said before. We know that there are other uh, mechanisms to, to do this, but this could, could give reference to such a uh, uh, yeah, to such a process that you're invited to, to check it out for yourself if you like to see how this would come to contribute. This is my last slide. So this would say now, when we take the data work, when we take the exchange of best available policies, and when we take all the full input of science and take this into this COP negotiating process with, together with the parties, then we would could uh, frame a productive process, uh, finally leaving us and converging to a global equity. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. So Lisa, when you didn't show up initially, I said, well, we need somebody to talk about adaptation and equity. And uh, we had this to decide that we'll have to reorganize another meeting. So, But now we're very pleased that you're with us and uh, look forward to, to your talk. Thank you. Um, thank you, Stefan. And of course, apologies for, for being late. Um, I, I, I trust you understand the, the competing demands that we have during these sessions. Um, so, how I've structured my presentation has been to look at the concept of equity pre-2015 and the concept of equity post the Paris Agreement and opportunities that we have in operationalizing this concept, um, especially in the context of the global stock take. Um, and th there's many formulations and permutations and, pro and proposals that you may have seen over the years. And however, they've been, um, uh, they, they had issues with getting traction in the context of negotiations, primarily because the concept of equity has a philosophical base, which is not easy to explain in a consistent manner across different circumstances. And in that regard, uh, the African group uh, going to Paris proposed what we refer to as the equity reference framework. Um, this was a three-pronged approach that we had put forward, which basically said if we have a temperature target or we have a temperature goal, there is um, a basis upon which we can understand um, how much do we need to invest in mitigation to achieve uh, the required emission pathways, as well as what is the impact risk that is associated with that temperature. and through that understanding you can address the first part of the methodology which is uh, understanding what the required efforts are the second part of it looked <coughs> excuse me looked at a concept of relative fair efforts to say um, now understanding what needs to be done who should be doing what and um, the proposal uh, that we had put forward had three sets of criteria and multiple metrics that, that could be used. The first one was the concept of historical responsibility, um, the second one being current capability, and the last one being uh, development needs or development goals uh, that developing countries have. So if one have metrics that address those three components, our proposition was that we can be able to have a basis of assessing fair efforts towards that required global effort. However, um, there were a number of points of divergence uh, amongst parties going to Paris. The first one was on the scope. Um, questions of, does, do we do this equity assessment uh, on the base of mitigation or adaptation or support or any other consideration or is it a combination of all? Of course, in our view, it's that um, 
global climate action uh, includes all these aspects. It's not limited to one or the other. However, we couldn't agree on that aspect. That was a key point of divergence. The second one was metrics used. Okay, um, As you might imagine, there's a number of metrics that we had even in, in previous pre presentations of proxies for understanding what will constitute a basis of assessing what is equitable. The third point pertained to um, the proposal focused on individual efforts or relative fair efforts that parties should undertake and uh, the paradigms of a top-down system vis-a-vis -a, -vis a bottom-up system um, was one of the points of divergence uh, in respect of this proposal. However, post Paris, I think we are in a different world in that um, the Paris Agreement in itself has got some nice provisions pertaining to equity, starting from the preambular paragraph, um, going to the, uh, to the article on global picking of, of emissions, including the stock take, saying the stock take will be undertaken in light of science and, equ and equity. So um, there has been some progress uh, in, in that regard. And secondly, the practice that we have seen, because sometimes in intergovernmental pro processes, we are so threatened about what we don't know, uh, once we start doing it, we start thinking, actually, this may not necessarily be such a bad thing. Um, in Lima, we agree that when parties communicate their INDCs, they should provide minimum information that explains why they believe that their contributions are ambitious and fair. Interestingly enough, as much as uh, we were saying there's we can't have metrics that um, can represent equity, etc., etc., we don't have more than six criteria that were, that were identified by parties in their INDCs. So which means this is not necessarily an insurmountable uh, problem. Um, and secondly, which is key to equity and the proposal that we had put forward is that it requires a definition of a temperature goal and an interpretation of what that means in, in respect of mitigation, adaptation and support. And if you look at Article 2 of the Paris Agreement, it sets a temperature goal, 2 degrees, pursuing 1.5, and then it, it outlines mitigation, adaptation, as well as the required financial flows to achieve this effort. So obviously we are in a different world than we were before pra Paris in respect of how the concept of equity can be operationalized in the Paris Agreement. But now we need to start looking at the practicalities um, of the negotiating process, particularly in respect of Article 14, the global stock take on how do we move from the abstract to the practical using what we know and what we have done. In that issue, I just want to quickly remind you of what we differed on. The first one was scope, metrics, and the issue of sovereignty. You know that uh, it is not desirable for the multilateral process to um, kind of instruct a country uh, that this is how much you need to do. That's not very par palatable. However, um, I will just show you a few things that respond to some of those differences that we had prior to Paris. Firstly, on scope, both in Article 2 and Article 14, there's a clear understanding that the scope is comprehensive. So the scope divergence that we had is no longer an issue as it was prior to Paris. So that's point one. Point number two, as I indicated, in respect of criteria for equity, uh, as much as uh, <laughs> when I was reading some INDCs, you know, there were parties that I would sit in a room and they would say, you can't have a criteria for equity. But when I read their INDC, they had something like um, GDP per capita, our cumulative emission, our capability is limited, all these issues that parties were saying are impossible. Actually, they, they, they reflected them. With respect to um, the three broad categories that uh, we have in the equity reference framework, the one that was reflected in proxy um, was the concept of development needs. A lot of parties use the concept of we are vulnerable as a proxy of um, the development gap that they are facing. So.
that's one of the, so in, in essence all those three dimensions that were identified um, are actually captured in the criteria that parties had addressed on the third point on sovereignty um, Paris embedded a concept of national determination and as I will show in my next slide um, it is well considered in how we can build equity into the global stock take in that there is no top-down perspective and secondly the global stock take as designed in the Paris Agreement is collective in nature it's not individual but the proposal that we have provides for a process through which you undertake the global stock take to ensure that you've got a balance between these two approaches. Key to that is the fact that um, this should be self-applied by parties. So parties should continue choosing their metrics. Um, however, as I will show in a, in a later slide, um, the only thing that gets done in the multilateral process is to use that specific metric as a proxy to say if you choose emissions per capita as your indicator consistent with 1,5 degrees or 2 degrees Celsius what is the global average and then you allow parties to go back to their domestic constituencies and say this is where we are this is where the global average should be and that provides a basis of um, discussion with regards to uh, the, the concept of equity. So to get to the more boring detail I would imagine which is what happens in the negotiations to get this scheme that I'm referring to working um, one will have to address it in two parts of the mandate um, of on the agenda item on the global state take. The first one will be that there is a need to develop guidelines on how to compute the metrics or the criteria that have been identified by parties. So we use as a starting point the, the synthesis report that the Secretariat prepared on the aggregate impact of, of NDC. The second aspect would be a technical assessment in the process of the global stock take to say um, for each of the different metrics. Um, this is what they mean in relation to the temperature scenario and article 14.3 of the Paris Agreement say following the stock take parties should um, enhance or update their NDCs. So parties having had an opportunity to see where their metric put them with regards to where the world should be should serve as a basis of them engaging their domestic constituencies as well as their peers in the international arena as such start that cycle of um, increasing um, ambition across all elements whether it's adaptation action mitigation action or provision of finance from an in input perspective um, the, the inputs into the stock take will therefore have to be a synthesis of each of these aspects, a synthesis of the mitigation component of indices uh, to understand where they take us um, in relation to the specific metrics, um, as well as in relation with adaptation, as well as the provision in Article 9.5 of the Paris Agreement on the requirement for de developed countries to binarily communicate indicative support to developed countries. So if you've got these three metrics, then you've got a sense of where we are in relation to where we need to do. And um, as the African group, we think um, we need to build on what is already on the table. So if we have a technical paper by the Secretariat that looks at these six or so criteria that have been used by parties, they can articulate dozens of metrics that talk to each of those, which parties can nationally determine which one they are going to use. But the important thing is the method of preparing those should be multilaterally agreed. And the last point will, uh, will be ensuring that on the information or the guidance for the preparation of subsequent indices, um, there is a linkage of how one generates the information that parties will communicate um, in the first place. So I hope with that reflection of where we were and what conditions we have now and what simple solutions we have um, that we can be able to operationalize this otherwise abstract concept. So thank you, Stefan.
Thank you very much to all of you. We have now 20 minutes left for a discussion and based on questions coming from you all. Yes, please. I think we have two microphones. Yeah, thank you, Elmar Kriegler, Potsdam Institute. Uh, thanks a lot for the inspiring presentations. You made clear two points. One is in order to have this ambitious uh, mitigation strategy and also adaptation, we need effort sharing. And the second one is those equity issues are not going away due to the fact that we have a bottom-up approach now as it it's will be an integral part of the global stock take. So um, what I'm interested in, that's my question, is um, we, of course, thinking about equity, you, you can easily uh, come up with a top-down approach uh, where you agree on a principle and then allocate, um, which doesn't have a good track record in international negotiations. So my basic question is, is there a bottom-up approach to equity? And I think the last presenter, actually, you went direct in this direction and, and, and talked about such a bottom-up approach. Um, so I would like to hear also the views of the other speakers. What do they think of, a bo of this bottom-up approach? And secondly, is there a place for um, uh, uh, a coalition of countries that would then adopt standards on metrics, like the high, high ambition um, uh, a coalition? Would, could there be a high equity standard uh, coalition? And would that be helpful in the process? Then, next question, please. Thank you, Lindsay Cook from the Quaker United Nations office. Much of the discussion, naturally being a multilateral negotiation, is about what nation states can and should do. But we are aware that a significant percentage of GHG emissions are created by multinational companies, which often lie outside nation state regulation. My question, are states considering a multilateral approach to multinational accountability on GHG emission responsibility, helping states' efforts to address mitigation, equity, and climate finance gaps, and which carbon tax model best addresses this polluter-pays approach, if at all? Thank you. Thank you very much. Would we have a third question? Otherwise, we'll... Move to, yes, please. Hi, Belinda Perriman from Teesside Collective. Um, I'm struggling a bit with the no fossil fuels um, in terms of no more jobs in, and no more steel, no more cement. Um, so what role do you see for collecting emissions in terms of carbon capture and storage rather than the ACT Alliance what looks very dramatic, you can't have fossil fuels anymore. Um, thank you. Okay, I think we have questions that address all the panelists. Maybe we'll just start um, on the right. Yeah. It's stark. We can't do with it. But we, um, so we have to rapidly put in place what we have now. We have to rapidly invest in research and technology We've got the, the sort of lower, you know, you, electricity can do that. Therefore, vehicles, you can do that. There are harder ones. Can we do low carbon um, insulation, housing, you know, the domestic? Can we do that next level of industry? We actually have to start dealing. And I think this is part of this equity. This discussion has to go from bickering, you know, what can I do or what are you doing? You're not doing that. You're into actually what can we do together? Um, and actually, I believe we can, investing, to me, investing in carbon capture and storage is investing in old technology. You know, it can be still use an old technology for longer and longer and longer, instead of really investing in the technologies of the future, the, the efficiency ones, efficient ones, the, the, the renewable ones, the ones that use local resources, not these multilateral corrupt um, sources. No, and you think it, it's, but you have to, it, there is no CCS technology that is working to scale at the moment. And uh, there isn't that's working to scale to, 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 to hide uh, away our problem for the future. 
So it is genuinely, um, the currently finance is, is propping up the fossil fuel industry. We have to find the incentives to show the risk of doing that. We have to really find, I think that links to the, um, the multilaterals, we really need to expose the risk, and that's risk of investing in an old-fashioned technology, something that's outdated, something we can't use anymore, but also the risk of continuing to, to use fossil fuels and dirty fuels, which are damaging people, vulnerable people around the world. We have to be faced, that's what I was saying, face up to that real ambition, that real effort that needs to be done and not pretend that we can just patch up old. Um, I, th I, th I think we need an open discussion on it and I think we need to not hide from point, you know, talking about fossil fuels. Com go governments don't want to talk fossil fuels because they're scared it will affect their economy. Instead of planning for that transition, would be my view. Thank you very much, Alison Doig. We had a question to the two economists regarding equity issues do not go away. How do you pursue a bottom-up approach? Yes. Okay, thank you. When I may start, I uh, very like the question. Thank you for this uh, idea. And I think I agree with the last speaker. We also have, of course, in this area, follow uh, the bottom-up approach. We have to see how far we can go. But in the end, we also must uh, uh, acknowledge that the bottom-up approach so far did not fully deliver. We had a broad participation, but our temperature goals cannot be uh, reached. So we have kind of to see by both sides. Of course, we do not want to impose top-down some uh, metric which we have found out in our research uh, uh, lab, but we want to kind of provide a structure which is flexible enough but which is still comprehensive and which is still kind of meaningful as a menu uh, to offer. And then the parties and the different stakeholders can together find out how, how much they want to value each of these criteria. And this could be a very productive process. And I very much like also the idea of a coalition of high equity standard countries. This could exactly trigger this momentum. Uh, one could implement this uh, with a limited uh, sample of countries and see how far this can go. And if this is uh, developed countries, they could also trigger some technologies. Uh, we heard it before, we, we need uh, still we need some technical progress. But I mean, this technical progress does not fall from heaven. In, in most cases, you know, think of war times, how creative people become when they want to implement a, a war machinery, of course, is a bad uh, comparison. But when we have urgency in the need of new technologies and we implement high equity standards and say the carbon budget is now very tightly limited, then we will find new technologies. Technologies already are, are there in many cases and in other cases we still have to, to improve on them. But this actually could exactly uh, trigger these uh, momentum effects which we basically need in the end to, to have uh, well the temperature targets uh, achieved. Yeah, thank you very much for the three questions. So let me start with uh, a top-down and bottom-up and, and effort sharing. I see basically two fundamental justifications for equity. The first one is you could start and say, I want to find a justice norm. And basically you argue then from a justice theory, from a philosophy of justice, what's the appropriate equity norm. And admittedly, so there is no universal norm, so there are several norms available, but it's a limited amount. A second approach is you want to have an equity norm which enhances cooperation. And these are different things, very, very different things. And uh, Lucas showed this. So if you are an egalitarian from a purely philosophical point of view, there are good reasons to be an egalitarian. But if you want to have a middle ground, I would argue for a middle ground because of we need an equity principle which enhances international cooperation. Because this is what is desperately needed when we want to achieve these very, very ambitious goals. It's a little bit more modest, a little bit more moderate, but this has also a chance to emerge from a kind of a bottom-up process. And what I would like to, I, li I like Lucas' proposal very much to start uh, thinking about equity from the rightness of procedure instead of just thinking about the goodness of outcome. But in the end, we have to combine both things and to evaluate what are the implications of the principle. I would argue people always want to see the implication of a norm and then they could agree on the norm. And therefore, I have a tendency to say effort sharing, equal effort sharing, is something which could be a reasonable focal point along the lines just enhancing international cooperation. The second question, 
uh, national states and, and multinationals and what's the appropriate carbon pricing scheme. I think, so there are, again, there are basically two fundamental approaches for that. The first one is, you say a country, a, a subset of countries imposes a carbon tax and then there are other countries who have no carbon tax and then you need a kind of a border tax adjustment. I have to say, and I have to admit, I'm not a big fan of border tax adjustments and I'll tell you why. Because what we see is in many countries that the export sector is much less carbon intensive than in many countries the domestic sector. If you have a lot of border tax adjustment, you basically penalize the relative carbon efficient sectors, which is not good at all. So therefore, instead of saying we want to have border tax adjustments, I very much uh, uh, favor an approach which basically says we want to integrate this different carbon pricing schemes regularly, because then you can mitigate all the competitiveness issues. And then in the end, under such a regulation, you have also the multinationals in, in included. So that would be, from my point of view, the pre preferable approach. And again, like a carbon uh, emission gap report, why not having annually a carbon pricing report? So we basically have now 20 uh, percent of emissions under a carbon pricing regulation. So what can we do to fill this gap and to include more more emissions from the different sectors? So this is has been already carried out by the World Bank and other institutions. But I would like to see a convergence of the gap reports of the different emission gap reports and the carbon pricing reports. The role of CCS, uh, here I, with all the politeness, I strongly disagree with you, uh, because carbon capture and storage probably will play an important role in the future. And if this is not to say I strongly disagree with you, that this is just an investment in an almost outdated technology. This might be the case in the case of coal, but in, even in the case of coal, carbon capture and storage could help. Think about negative emissions. If you want to achieve a 1.5 degree target, this is not feasible without negative emissions. Not feasible without negative emissions. And the negative emissions technology we know already li very likely have some carbon capture and storage comp component like the combination of biomass and carbon capture and storage. There is absolutely no way to achieve a 1.5 degree target uh, with, with, without negative emissions. And also uh, industry emissions, process emissions, or something which can, which has to be compensated. I'm not arguing, at least in Europe or in other parts, we should push for coal CCS, but at least for industry CCS and in the combination of with bioenergy, we should have at least pilot projects. I know you disagree with me, but you should think about if you are a strong proponent of the 1.5 degree target, I tell you, and I go in, in, into a big fight with you, so <laughs> that, 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 that without negative emissions, not possible. that's not possible. Okay, but this is uh, the only disagreement that I have here. So thank you very much. I don't know if you want to have the big fight right <laughs> now. or Xolisa, <laughs> <laughs> uh, would you like to answer any of those questions? Um, uh, just to reflect on, on, on the first one, I think um, what, I, what I was presenting was precisely to express um, the, the difficulty of a purely top-down approach, uh, the, the, the track record that you referred to, in that it has not been that great because there has not been traction. But with conditions that we have now, you basically can establish a, a workable balance of both national determination, allow countries to choose the metrics that they would like to use, but now have um, this benchmarking process of saying, you've made your choice, however, this is how you generate that information, and this is how you assess yourself. So you are self-applying equity metrics rather than a third party um, telling a party what to do. However, in the global stock take, I think there is space for the creative um, uh, calculators as well as um, um, equity reviews that civil society does, etc., to further illustrate or help parties to do a self-assessment on, on these aspects. Um, if there will be a high equity standard coalition, I think there's a number of Af African countries that will join you on, on, on that one. Um, on the question from Lindsay about um, the question of nation-states vis-a-vis um, uh, uh, multinational 
company emissions. I think purely from a negotiating perspective, um, because this is an intergovernmental process and that a lot of the activities um, that are undertaken, um, they are in some sovereign territory that is um, part of the the, the the UNFCCC system. So one way or the other, those um, are counted for uh, domestically. So it will be domestic policies, nationally determined policies that will uh, determine how that is dealt with. But that raises a very interesting question because as far back as 2007, when it comes to the concept of equity, there were questions around um, not accounting emissions on the basis of where they come from, but where the consumption is, because that changes the picture um, uh, quite drastically because if you look at a country like China, for example, high emissions because it's the factory of the world, but who's consuming those products? Increasingly, there's a lot of Chinese consuming those products, but primarily these are consumed elsewhere. So there are a lot of tricky issues and pitfalls, you know, when it comes to how one deals with these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we won't get into it big fight but just a small discourse so Alison Doig you have to well I just wanted to come back in the Bex issue I, mean, I think if you want to get into a huge equity agenda Bex will be it because it needs massive that means growing masses of crops burning them and then storing the carbon where are those land going to be taken I mean, the, the, the acreage is just unimaginable if, if you go down that route so whose land is it going to be whose food is it going to replace so I think the equity issues associated are, are, are absolutely Huge. I think there are many, many options for mitigating rapidly, fast. You know, we have to exhaust all of those before we even think about going down a, um, a, a route like that. But, but as I say, f from the equity point of view, I think that would um, be quite explosive. <laughs> no, I, I think you, you, you're raising a, a very important point, but let me, let me highlight the, the following. So I do not deny the enormous, the enormous challenge. But it would be good if we could agree. So a 1.5 degree target is basically, in the worst case scenario, we basically have to compensate each ton of CO2 which we're emitting now, we have to compensate it later if we want to achieve this target. And I'm not saying that negative emissions are a kind of a, a mean or a tool where we can postpone mitigation, not at all. We have to start rapidly, we have to start now we need all the uh, advanced renewable technologies. There is no doubt about this. We need storage technologies. But if you read all this, and I'm not saying this, I'm not, uh, I'm not on the payroll of one of the large uh, fossil fuel suppliers. What I'm saying is for a 1.5 degree target, it is very, 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 very unlikely you can do it without negative emissions. You have to answer also this question. And what I'm saying is, if you think about bioenergy, biofuels in the first generation, so this cannot be done. You need a lot of pilot projects, you need a lot of research and development, and I've, I fully understand what you are saying, that you cannot do it in a, in a way which is, which is irresponsible, you have a lot of land conversion and all sorts of things. I do not deny the enormous social problems, but this is partially an implication of the 1.5 degree target. And I think this can be manageable, but this is a really, really huge challenge. Thank you very much. We're slowly getting to the end of our meeting. We have one and a half minutes left, so. Okay. Um, well, I have to apologize that I haven't been in the whole session, but there's just one point, very brief point I wanted to raise and then a question. The point to raise was that um, I believe at the summit of the local and regional governments at COP in a few days' time, they'll actually be agreeing a framework for locally uh, developed contributions, uh, for locally defined contributions. And I think it's really important that thinking about the kind of models that you're talking about, uh, that there's the provision for, say, California to be able to participate and be included in this process. And I think it's crucial, and perhaps talking about that is a useful thing. And my question is really, if you're gonna to come to a total point of equity, and this comes to the gentleman in the end's point about consumption, um, really is the only equitable end point, if not the process by which you get there, being a carbon ration, a carbon budget for each person on this planet? And isn't that really the only equitable uh, result? And that surely has to be based on consumption, and that also allows you to rein in the multinationals.
I look at the colleagues in the back of the room. Do we have another few minutes? One minute. Okay. So. <laughs> Uh, uh, very quickly, I, I don't think that basically allocate a carbon budget equally among all the citizens on planet Earth is doing justice. No, I'm not saying that. That's the end point. But, no, but in, in the end, what I would say is, even from a, from a negotiation process, if you negotiate just about this carbon budget, you create a zero-sum game. I think you will not achieve anything. What we should do instead is we should, Im should embed the justice and the equity and the effort sharing issue in a much broader framework where we should also include the sustainable development goals and, and show people, for example, what is the potential, for example, of carbon pricing to finance sustainable development goals, increasing human well-being. It seems to me this is a much more productive p path forward than uh, just to allocate uh, a given budget and creating a zero-sum game. Okay, thank you very much. Some of us just came out of the negotiations on the global stock take. Equity was a big uh, topic and I think we'll need your advice over the next few years even more. Thank you very much. So I pass the floor on to Rudelmar Bueno de Faria, the General Secretary of Act Alliance, to close our meeting. Thank, thank you, you very much. We had some disagreements, but most agreements as well. And, uh, uh, in terms of the, we need to be ambitious in these negotiations if you want to, to reach the target of 1.5. That is absolutely we need to do. And for doing that, we need global cooperation and partnerships on, uh, mainly based on the existing political frameworks like the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Sendai uh, framework for disaster risk reductions. But also we know that we need political wills will, especially from governments, but also the private sector, but also political pressure, advocacy from different parts, even to address issues related to the role of the multinationals and transnational companies as well in contributing for this. And we need also to have evidence and s or science-based uh, processes in this process, in, in, the, in these uh, discussions. But we, one thing that's come, on, we know that you have only one planet, and there are human beings living on this planet. If you will not take this seriously, we will not address any issue related to equality, not only in terms of the negotiations, but also in terms of the equality in the more human dignity perspective. We, on behalf of the uh, government of Switzerland and the ACT Alliance, we uh, thank you very much for participating of this event, and we hope that uh, that has somehow contributed for your discussions internally and in the negotiations as well. Have a good evening, and you see you next year.